I'm going to talk in English. I hope that's okay. Yeah? Good. Okay. No, it's been too long. Uh, I can't really remember Italian very well, so apologies uh, at the outset. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you, Massimo. Um, and for me, working with De Carlo and uh, Massimo and the, my colleagues, for me, was the, the best experience professionally I've ever had. Uh, and I'm going to tell you about what I've been doing in the last 25 years since then, working for Hopkins Architects in London. Is that the right level? Yeah. So we are an office of about 100 people. Uh, this is some of us. Uh, we work out of London. One of the senior partners does some work in Dubai. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the practice, the design evolution. I'm going to talk a bit more about some projects I've been very involved in. And I'm going to explain our kind of attitude to architecture and sustainability. So that's us. Um, and we do, we're kind of hard for people to precisely say what we do in our style. We don't really have one. We work on very particular projects um, and we approach them with a, a similar philosophy, but we don't have a stylistic approach and we don't work in any one sector. So we've done hospitals, sports buildings, schools, you name it. We've been very lucky to work on a wide variety of projects. So Michael Hopkins uh, is 83 now. He's retired. He was actually a partner with Norman Foster and designed the Willis Faber building in Ipswich, which was a seminal piece of architecture for the time. It was Pilkington's with the planar glazing, uh, high-tech finishes inside. So he worked on that with, with Norman. So his origins were very much high-tech. Uh, the generation of architects, Richard Rogers, Norman Foster, Michael, Nicholas Grimshaw, all came out of the Architectural Association at that same time and have been this kind of dynasty of uh, uh, fantastic architects in the UK. So he did that building. He then set up on his own. And he built himself a house from which the practice started uh, in Hampstead, very similar to the Charles Eames and Ray Eames house. Uh, their house tried to buy elements out of a catalogue in a very American way and assemble them. Michael built this house trying to use an absolute minimal number of components. So it has metal sides, glass ends, a very small column grid, and was an expression about how you would craft a building in the arts and crafts tradition, high-tech tradition, how you make all the elements, how you would scale each piece and bring them together. Very elegant house, looks exactly the same today. Um, and from, from then, they then developed a system, a bit like this kind of thing, called Patera, where they designed a whole uh, way of building a building by designing the parts, a sort of Jean Prouvé, approach to architecture, rationalizing construction down to components. So there was a very sort of forensic way of looking at the problem of detailing, of structure, and minimizing the amount of material in the building. In terms of sustainability, these were buildings with not much insulation, no particularly sophisticated systems, but very nice feeling inside, nice daylight. And so our offices are made up of two of these buildings in Marylebone. If you come to London, give me a call, come and visit, it's very nice. There's an ex-colleague here who worked in the building. It's very nice because there's lots of daylight. Um, it gets a little bit cold in the winter and a little bit hot in the summer because we don't have air conditioning. Um, and from, from these early kind of high-tech projects, um, the office went on to sort of explore the use of steel and glass and, and become expressive. This was a project in Cambridge, which is in the very flat area of Britain and has some sort of beautiful college and church spires and the idea for building this big building for Schlumberger, which was for research into mineral drilling, civil engineering, was to not put a big shed on the horizon. So how do you make a building with a filigree, interesting profile? And so Michael and the team developed with Arup, working very, very closely with uh, the engineers at Arup, of one of the very early tensile structures. And this allowed the structure to express itself with masts and tensile shapes. So really sort of using materials and a very strong understanding of materials to make this expressive architecture. The building on the left came along later after computers, and the computers in there do about 10 times as much work as in the physical testing. Very rational, very ordered. And one of those three bays is actually used for social spaces. So this is late 70s, classic high tech. And then the project... Um, that came along that changed the way we did architecture in the office was significant because there were a number of architects working in steel, glass, maybe concrete. We did a competition for the Mound Standard Lords. This is cricket, a very particular English game. 
Lords is the home of cricket. And uh, we built this stand. But what was unusual, it was a competition. And there was an existing stand there already. And what the office proposed was to keep some of the brick arches, which were 18th century. And there were seven arches. Everyone else knocked them down. We decided to keep the brick and to extend it, build another 22 arches. And in doing that, we had to go and find out about lime mortar, expansion joints, the old technology of, of being um, working with, uh, with bricks. So there's a clever structure worked out with Arup with six columns and a kind of counterweight and a tie down at the back, all sitting on top of this base. And this, pub this project really caught the imagination because it was the old heavy bricks at the bottom and then the lightweight structure at the top. So it had a nice image but it was also for us becoming familiar with traditional materials and working in a traditional way. And importantly for sustainability later, working with thermal mass as it, as it turned out. We knew about heavy solid materials. So these are the, the arches that we extended and then the building floating over the top. These cables actually hold down the structure at the back and give you a good view of the cricket pitch. So having uh, started to understand brick, matone, and the, the construction, <coughs> um, the office won a competition to do Glyndebourne Opera House, which is an opera house in the countryside, very beautiful. And really, I guess, taking inspiration from Louis Kahn and this very rational grid approach, but in brick, uh, designed a whole opera house in a grid and a frame, but using brick, load-bearing, arches, all beautifully expressed. Uh, so a very rational plan, the, st the stage, the back of house, uh, the opera house, all built in a brick frame. So on the outside, you see the layering going up next to the old house, the inside in precast concrete and timber for acoustics. So you have this high-tech architecture which has changed and become soft, contextual. The brick was the same brick factory as built the house. Uh, it's heavy. And yet the principles of thinking about architecture are the same as, as they were with the high tech. Uh, and from that project, the office won a competition to build a massive new office complex for the uh, tax inspectorate, the Inland Revenue, which is a series of buildings and took this idea of rationalizing the construction down, working very closely with Arup. They made a series of buildings 14 meters wide, which were good for getting daylight in. Uh, we could make column free space. So, a series of piers made in factories, prefabricated, precast concrete going across. So this is a very low cost building, but by having repetitive elements, you could have good quality. So white concrete spanning across. And at this time, uh, started to look about energy in use in the buildings. So in terms of uh, quality of space, uh, daylight, very important. At the time, electricity for lighting was, was far more demanding than now. Uh, but in terms of ventilation, the UK doesn't get so hot, it's not so humid. You can just about run natural ventilation. So this was a building which had a series of fans on the facade, big floor voids, and we were driving air through the building. It was experimental at the time. And to get the buoyancy, to get the warm air out, we built these chimneys that had the fire escapes in. So they were working as two things, the staircase. They were clad with glass so they'd get warm, and that would drive buoyancy and pull the air through. So it was very experimental. Uh, the systems were, Arab engineered it. The tops of those towers moved up to let the air out and came down and closed off in the winter. So a kind of systems approach, very rational, very ordered. Um, and then there was sort of three buildings in this evolution worked on with Arab, and it was really useful because the technology in each one of them could slightly evolve each time. The next one was the Portcullis House for the government in London. Um, and this was more sophisticated. It's a very complex building because it's actually two projects. Above was the Houses of Parliament, the, the building for all the politicians. Underneath was a massive intersection of, of tube lines for Westminster Tube. And we could only have six columns which came up between the tube lines, the Metropolitana, and the structure above. So we had the red with the arches that spanned across. Uh, and then the rectangular building with the courtyard in the middle sat on top of that. Again, a narrow 13-meter building to get daylight in on both sides and a complex structure between the two. So this was the excavation for the uh, tube lines, which instead of having small spaces, we excavated out, dug down, cast the concrete, and put the escalators in. 
And then above, there's a courtyard space, which is all top lit, with a rectangular building going around. Here you see the arches. So again, a very sort of rational approach to construction, but um, using timber to make the large span structure. And then the sophistication of this project was in how the uh, engineering allowed the building to breathe. This part of London's quite polluted. It was difficult to open the windows, also for security. So there's a very sophisticated system at the top of the building with air handling units. So the blue air is coming in, goes into an air handling unit, comes down the facade, and goes out into the floor plate with the air displacement system. The air comes through the floor, is then collected on the outside of the facade and goes back. There's a thermal wheel that captures the energy, and then the chimneys at the top expel the air. So compared to the previous project, we're recirculating the energy, recirculating the air. And that expression of the structure going thinner and the ducts getting fatter started to inform the facade design. Very sophisticated and all working in a very small space. So the system with Arup actually involved making the facade breathe like lungs so the air could flow through the facade. The solar gains would warm up the facade. So really specific control of the buoyancy and everything on the air. And again, using the concrete to uh, provide thermal mass and stabilize the temperatures internally. So these projects take a long time. The client has to believe in it. You have to explain everything to them. They have to understand it. Their facilities people have to understand it. Quite complicated. And then you see how the office used this as a sort of expression of the architecture to put a new building next to the Gothic Pugin Houses of Parliament and have a very vertical expression with the chimneys. There have been some problems. We had, um, we had uh, aquifers going down for ground source heat pumps, uh, which tended to get all the, the sand and the silt in, so they were problematic. The light shelves were a little bit difficult because they got so dirty they didn't reflect the light into the room. And then the third project in this kind of series of experiments with Arup was a, a big new campus for the University of Nottingham, a much lower budget, but again, a very rational process to how the buildings were ventilated. We actually took the old bicycle factory for rally and proposed a big new campus and put a lake in, and the top part was the first phase. Um, so the lake went in, this was an old library, and then the buildings are just simple concrete with timber cladding. But you see some ventilation uh, elements at the top, which we designed on aeronautical bearings. They were for purging out the heat. Again, we had thermal wheels at the top. We we're bringing the cool air in off the water and processing it through the buildings. So we, we persuaded the client they could build this very simple, regular buildings, very affordable, and then actually, between the buildings, put some glass and win some space and have semi-indoor, outdoor space. Very efficient and very popular. So that project was successful. Um, so we, we learned a lot doing that. And then um, I didn't work on any of those projects. This is one of my earlier projects. We won a competition for Yale to build a school of forestry and sustainability. And they'd seen our work and thought it was very interesting. Could we do a building for them? But they were very uh, skeptical that we could design for the humid climate in Connecticut. It's very hot, it's very cold, and it can be very humid. Would our system for the UK climate, which allowed the buildings to breathe, work? So we worked with Arup and Atelier 10 um, on this project and came up with a very simple concept for the building in this space, which was to have a linear building, two courtyards which stepped up, and a piazza at the end. This is the Sarin and uh, ice rink opposite. So it's a very simple, rational building, um, and they had lots of offices, which were kind of not very interesting architecturally, so we took all the interesting spaces and put them on the top, uh, and then made a staircase that took you up to the top. There was a nice park at this end. The Sarin and building was at the other end, so the idea was to have uh, glass on the ends. We knew the efficient way to design this building was to have about 40% glazing, not try and make it a glass box. So the construction, as ever in America, is a concrete frame, and then we had a laminate uh, roof on the top. And then we clad it in the local stone, used timber at the ends. We had photovoltaics facing south, and we built the two courtyards and fitted into the, the context of Yale. Uh, and then the ends we glazed so you could see into the building. It had two entrances, one at either end. And um, when we went for the interview, we were sort of waiting, waiting to have our turn to go and speak to them. And we noticed there were lots of plans of all the forests that Yale had. So we had this idea, which was to 
chop down the trees at the start of the project, let the timber season, and then use the timber, the wood, from their own forests to make their own building. So we did that. We got them to chop down some wood at the start, some trees. We seasoned the wood, and then we lined the building with their own timber, which was nice because it was a school of forestry. So they were inside their own forest. So this is the lounge at the end looking out. This is the big long space at the top. And you, we put the glass roof lights in. We put the PVs on show you so you could sort of explain what was happening. This building was uh, at the time when America wasn't really looking at green buildings at all. We had to explain everything to them. They didn't understand air displacement or thermal mass or any of those things. Now with LEED, they're you know, experts at it. But this was really quite experimental for them. So what we, what we find on all these projects is, um, and this is the main message, there's no one easy way to improve the performance of the building. You have to work on lots of different things. It's very painful. It's very hard work. You need to do lots of things. So this project, at the start of it, we had to write down all the sustainable things we could do. And we had a list of 26 items. Because it was America, they did a cost-benefit analysis, what each one would cost, what the payback was. Uh, and they evaluated which were going to perform the best. So we wanted to put a labyrinth underneath the building and pass air through it, but they worked out the payback was 100 years because their fuel costs are so low. So uh, what survived on the building, we had uh, photovoltaics on the top. They generate 25% of the energy. Uh, we had very good insulation. We had good daylighting. We had thermal mass inside. We exposed the concrete, which, of course, for, was very radical for them, for an Ivy League university. Uh, Leeds got this great thing that the materials have to come from 500 miles, 700 kilometers from the site, which is good. Uh, we had ensured there was lots of shading. We put soil hot water collectors on the facade. We did have ground source heat pumps on this project, but we had closed ones, so we didn't have the problem with silt. We collected all the water, and we did use, to some extent, uh, air from the basement to, to uh, have a decoupled thermal mass. So the thing we did on this project that was quite radical was we we had a different operating system for hot and uh, hot, cold and kind of inclement weather. So a day like today, that building can be like your house. You can just open the window and shut down the mechanical systems. In the middle of winter or the middle of summer, when it's very humid, you can't open the window because you let either too much cold air in or too much humidity. So the building is genuinely mixed mode. And we had to persuade them to do this. And the way it works is that when you walk into the building, if it's a daylight today, there's a green light. You can open your window. The mechanical system's not on. If it's very cold or very hot, there's a red light on. You can't open your window. And the mechanical system runs with air displacement. So it was a, it was a real challenge to get them to agree to that. It was America. They wanted to have the same standards as air conditioning. So it was a, re a really complex process. So the systems are either heating you up, cooling you down, or it's a totally natural, um, naturally ventilated building. So that was, that was very successful. They absolutely loved that building. Uh, it's not carbon neutral. What we find is um, the, the, build, the use of the building's plug loads, the, gen, the electricity people plug into and use, actually pushes it beyond being carbon neutral. Uh, it's also incredibly popular. So when it was meant to close at 8 o'clock at night, it now closes at midnight or 1 o'clock in the morning, so it has extended use. Um, but it's been, it has been a really informative building for them. It was lead platinum, and they've gone on to do more lead platinum buildings. We then had a commission from Princeton um, who'd seen that building, liked it, and they wanted to build a, a chemistry lab. But this chemistry lab had to be the best chemistry lab in the world, of course. Uh, and so every student had a fume hood, it had every possible thing to attract the best researchers to the laboratory. So how do we do a nice piece of architecture, and how do we provide this incredible level of servicing, you know, massive amounts of air moving through the building? Uh, clearly, you can't have the air coming out of the, lab, the labs and the fume hoods back into the building. So we developed uh, a plan that was very rational. The yellow is the laboratory spaces, which could all be um, very compartmentalized and altered. The red is the servicing for that, and the blue is the more academic spaces. So we pull them apart, and we've got daylight into both sides of the big atrium. And then we reuse the air sort of uh, several times. So we would take the air, uh, ventilate the, the blue space, put it into the atrium, and then use that air to go into the laboratories and put thermal wheels on the top and, and do what we could with a very technical space. So it's massive building, very rational construction, 
uh, exposed concrete inside, and again, been very successful. So there's a big space inside, lots of daylight, views in, and laboratories on the right-hand side. Um, we've then had a just finished a project recently at Harvard, which has been very interesting. It's a Louis Cert building from the late 1960s, uh, 10 stories high, a big H block, a whole city block. Um, and they wanted to build a new campus center there, um, but they didn't have enough money to do the whole building. So we, in the end, amended the two floors in the, at the base and did some work on the top floor. It's too complicated to sort of explain in this lecture, but um, I mean, I think it's a key part of sustainability is to work with old buildings and to give them extra life. There's so much um, embodied carbon in these projects. The idea of pulling them down to build a sustainable building isn't really tenable. So re we rework this um, very, very precisely, taking out the bottom areas of the building and putting in a new campus center, bringing greenery uh, with these vitrines, with trees into the inside, green walls, and getting daylight into the building. Okay, so that sets the scene for the uh, project I'll talk about in a bit more detail. This is the headquarters for the World Wildlife Fund in the UK. We won a competition for this project. They're a charity. They obviously believe in the planner and wanted to do the right thing. They couldn't afford a site to buy, buy a site to build a new building. But one of the councils on the periphery of London said, well, look, you can have this car park. But they had to still use it as a car park. So this is like an air rights building, say, in New York, where we had the permission to build over the car park. So there's the car park. There's a canal here and some woods on that side. And then some really terrible buildings and a very busy road just out of the picture. So the, the concept was really, could we keep the car park and then float a kind of green carpet over that and make a whole new world above the car park and then put some elegant timber structure over the top of that and have a very low energy building that had the car park underneath and a, a completely separate office environment inside. And what we did was we didn't want people in the office to have any sense of the cars underneath at all. So this structure on the right on the sketch suggests we have gardens around the outside and we just bring the structure out to cover the road and then we could have a big arch going over uh, using that extra width that lets light drop down inside, and by carefully locating the windows, we could control the views outside. So that was the concept. This is one of those projects where the concept stayed with it right all the way through, it seemed to work. Here was a cross section, so there's the busy road. We put some trees in, the car park underneath, and then mezzanines inside this big space with gardens around the outside. Uh, it's a very simple, low-cost um, system. We don't have expensive joints. It's a sort of agricultural type uh, framework. Here's a contractor putting in, putting in these spans. And there's the finished building. It's a very nice space. Uh, daylight comes down. The speakers uh, broadcast the sound of birds and animals in the jungle playing, so it's very relaxed in there. And we controlled it so when you look out, you just see nice views to greenery in the canal, lots of greenery inside. And they have a system of hot desking to mean they don't, the building can be as small as possible. They share the desks. So the, the, the plan of the building looks something like that. We have a bridge across the canal. We have a, a deck above the car park. And then greenery all around the outside, a visitor center, toilets, and then a, the big workspace at the back. It's in a place called Woking, which is uh, south of London, suburban part of London. Not really London, to be honest. <laughs> so uh, here you have a sense of this internal space, the entrance. There's an exhibit for school children at the bottom, a big lecture theater at the top. On top of the building, the circles are, are vents for exhausting the air in summer when it's very hot. Now, the thing about those exhausting chimneys is they're great for getting the air out when it's hot, but the energy also disappears at the same time. So we only use that when it's very hot. The rest of the time, we collect the air at a high level, go back down into air handling units, recirculate the energy, and recirculate the air. So this building has a number of sustainable measures on it. Uh, again, you have to work on all of these things to, to get towards carbon neutral. So one of the interesting ones is we put phase change materials uh, on the top, so they're on the ceiling. With a, with a lightweight roof like this, you don't have the benefit of having concrete overhead because it's lightweight. So these have got liquid paraffin in and they change their state 
at about 20 odd degrees. So they mimic the energy performance of a, of a, a more a thermally massive material. So uh, we don't have data on how well that works, but it was one of the experimental things we did in the building. Um, we use the same idea as Yale, that if it's really humid or really cold, the windows don't open and air comes up through the floor. We've got a whole series of tubes underneath the car park that act to bring the air through. The ground is at typically 12 degrees centigrade, so that is good for heating in the winter and cooling in the summer. So here on the um, bottom left, you see where the air comes in, goes through pipes underneath the car park, uh, and draws up and goes into the building. We recycle all the water, which is never cost effective. You always have to persuade the client that's a good thing to do. We've got the greenery on the outside. There you can see on the diagram, the cross section, the pipes going down, the uh, thermal ducts underneath. So a whole series of measures making the building work all the time. So this, this gives you some idea of how the ground source heat pumps work. There's a big uh, floor void underneath the ground floor, the, the raised floor, where the air comes up and comes in. We limit the amount of glass, very important, to stop the, the energy in the building coming too much. And then if it's a nice day like it is here today, the system, the mechanical system switches off. Fans generally lose quite a lot of power, so if you can open the windows, you'll use elect less electricity, and you can let out warm air at the top, and cool air can come in at low level. I think one of the big things that's changed is with LED lighting, we can get much better performance on lighting now, and that has dr you know, drastically improved the performance of all of these buildings. We also did a project here where we monitored very precisely the embodied carbon in the project. Every single lorry, every material uh, was really carefully scrutinized, and there was a log of someone doing that, and it was really interesting. So <coughs> on the end walls, we were going to put triple glazing in, three layers of glass. Um, it was more expensive, but it performed better, better U-value. Uh, we found out that Actually, because the frames are bigger, there's more glass. There will be m more carbon used in the triple glazing than if we'd actually just put double glazing in. So d double glazing didn't work quite as well, but on the overall carbon story, it was better to put that in. So there's one or two things that are, are counterintuitive. And so when we'd finished stage C, or Progetto di Massima, we had a project. And by following... Um, a carbon log and knowing exactly how much carbon was in all of the materials, we reckon we saved 40% more carbon by these people telling us every time we had a choice to choose the low carbon option. So without spending any more money, but being informed about the carbon in the materials, we saved 40% between progesity massima and completion, which tells you that you're acting kind of blind most of the time. You don't know how much carbon you're specifying in materials. You don't know where they're coming from. You don't know the, the full extent of embodied carbon. If you're informed about that, you have a kind of carbon economy and you can be told about it, you can make signif significant uh, reductions in the amount of carbon you consume. So it, it's difficult. We all know it's really critical, the amount of embodied carbon in the building, but it's very hard to monitor it and, do, and to work with it closely. We now have software which we can use which starts to inform that process. It's actually quite a lot of work to really understand it and be on top of it. And clients have, are not so aware of it yet. But it will be the next thing we all need to do, which is to really understand the amount of energy that goes into building a building. Uh, there's the final building in the trees, the cars underneath. Uh, so I'll just quickly show you another project, which is a refurbishment project. This is for a cathedral in Norwich, a really challenging project. There's one little piece of wall left here. Uh, so this is the ultimate in kind of extending the life of a building from sort of 15th century right through to today. So this was a rare example of building on the footprint of the existing cloisters. Um, we invented a structural system which left the old walls um, in red. We kept our new walls separate. So we had some oak posts and beams that came up from above. Uh, there's the old bit of wall you saw, our new walls, the lead roof, everything on the top. Cross section with these trees which hold the roof up and stay off the old medieval fabric. This is upstairs in the cafe. So in terms of embodied carbon, I mean, extending the life of buildings is a fundamental and obvious thing we should be doing. Not building short-term temporary buildings. Um, and again, devices we like to use in our office visible ends of the building, transparency, connectivity, 
structural expression. So the, the next kind of significant project really in that evolution um, is the velodrome for the Olympics in 2012, uh, which I was fortunate to, to work on. Um, a really challenging commission because uh, everyone in the world is looking at the Olympics. Everyone wants to know about it. Beijing had been the previous Olympics and they'd had all this incredible fanfare and amazing experience on television, but not very sustainable. Not necessarily that kind of carefully thought out. Looked fantastic. So how could London? London could not compete at making a spectacle, but it could compete at trying to do something more sophisticated and perhaps more intelligent. So on the velodrome, we were given a brief of 6,000 seats um, and to make a sustainable building. So we really wanted to, and afterwards there's going to be a whole cycle park with activities outside. So the concept was, okay, we've got the track. We put some of the crowd around the track and really get a good focus for the crowd. And then build a concourse that would have views into the track, but also afterwards views out. Most velodromes are just boxes with no connection to the outside. And we wanted this to have a connection both to look out and people to look in and get inspired. And then we put the other half of the spectators up above the concourse. So we would be able to split the building in half. So this is the section we came up with. We have the track at the bottom, half the seats, a kind of concourse, and we raised the ground up. The ground was very, very contaminated, so we didn't push it into the ground. We worked out carefully a kind of cost analysis and carbon that were better to keep the building slightly up. And then the roof, um, we went through various iterations. We finally persuaded the client we would build a cable net roof. It would be incredibly efficient. So it spans about 120 meters, and it's 36 millimeter diameter cables. So <coughs> the geometry work that we, uh, and the philosophy for the building was that we would make it as small as we could because the smaller it is, the less material, less carbon, less cost, but also the smaller the volume inside, which you then need to heat, light, and everything else. So we, we drew the seats, we drew the track, and we literally squeezed it down as much as we could. Because we had a cable net, we needed an anti-clastic double curve structure for efficiency to hold it rigid. So in one direction, it spans down 12 meters, and that's like a suspension bridge. In the other direction, it arcs up four meters, and the two pull against each other, and that gives you the rigid structure. We also knew that having this interplay between concave and convex in three dimensions would be really exciting. So uh, this is the chaos of the Olympic site, three years before <laughs> you have the Olympics, uh, digging out the foundations, and then we had 48 trusses um, that went round with this kind of amazing roller coaster shape around the top. That was a pipe from the gas industry in Canada that was formed the curve around the top. I'm now going to try and play a little movie. So this, this, this is a short movie of the cable net going up. Funciona? So it's, it's, using this cable net was quite a big thing because these big government projects in the spotlight, they don't like to take risk. Um, and they, they thought this might be quite risky. Ah, bravo, that's it. <laughs> so it was an incredibly efficient thing. We needed no scaffolding to, to go up. No one was working at height. In one day, this thing could be pulled into place. Incredibly lightweight structures. They're clearly very low carbon, very efficient. So, worth seeing because it happened so quickly in one morning. That was then pulled into shape. Whoa. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. So, if you think about it, in the Olympics in Munich in 1972, 40 years earlier, had had the amazing Fry Otto structure. There's nothing particularly amazing about us using um, 
a tensile structure. I mean, 40 years ago it had been done. What that project had there, they had uh, kind of perspex panels on the top. We needed to insulate this building because in, after the Olympics when it was being used, it would need to be insulated to keep the heat in. So we had the challenge of how would you put a traditional insulated roof on top of a cable net, but the cable net obviously is going to have some movement. So all the experimentation on this project was about how we built the panels on the roof and how we fitted that onto a cable net. Sorry, folks. Thank you. I just took it. Yeah, thanks. So that's the cable net in position, uh, tor pulled into shape. And we made it so it would have only half a meter deflection. So it's very, very complicated to work out the movement of each of the pieces. But we made some very, very lightweight, simple uh, plywood panels that went on the top. They would just arrive from the factory and get dropped on the top. So lots of thinking, but actually in terms of material, very, very efficient. And then on the outside, we clad it in western red teeter, uh, cedar um, using this shape. And you can see how it comes down very small at the back. The idea, visually, was to get the excitement of the track, have the crowd very closely around the track, and then have the cladding of the building resembling the track. So you get an excitement uh, from seeing the sense of the curvature, the dynamism of the building, rather like the track. Uh, there was the building in the Olympics. So it's a big building, 120 meters by 100 meters, but really comes down to a human scale at the end. Um, and there, they used it in use for the trial event with the daylight coming in, the track center, the crowd at the sides. So the building had a fantastic atmosphere. Um, we did, um, we worked with Klaus Boda, who I know has given a talk at the school on this, and we had, the building could breathe, we could either heat it up, because in the competition, they want the air very, very hot, and if it's hot, the air's thinner and they go faster, so they break world records. So for the Olympics, we had to heat it up like an oven, Afterwards, we didn't want to put that energy in. So we had natural ventilation afterwards, lots of insulation in the roof, but bits of equipment we could warm the building up and a heated floor underneath. Um, so just to give you an idea of how this building performed in terms of the, the story of tons of carbon per square meter. So the bird's nest uh, or the aquatics or the main stadium, in terms of tons per square meter, we're an absolute fraction of that because the building has got so little material in it. So it's an interesting kind of story about how you can make interesting shapes, sculptural shapes, but you've got to be thinking about the amount of material in that building. Um, and then for legacy, what was important really was to uh, not use too much electricity to heat the building or to light the building. So we did lots of work on the, on the roof lights. And so this was looking at getting the right amount of uh, window glass in the roof so we could have a very uniform light for cycling underneath. So you wouldn't need to put the electricity on. Um, and that's what we did. So you can see there, very good light coming through those roof lights that we studied with Klaus and the team. So afterwards, you're not paying lots of money to put electricity on. And then <coughs> that's Britain, Brexit Britain, Armageddon. OK, so um, we then went on and had a little project, which was nice in terms of legacy. So this, the, this is the Olympics in 1948 in London. So actually, when everyone said, oh, London's so green, it's so amazing, I go, not really. This is, this is really green. This is 1948. One of the cyclists who won the, uh, the bronze medal for Britain here then cycled home to Birmingham afterwards, which would be like cycling back to Milan after the event. There's no lights. There's no television. Everyone went by public transport. So we are making lots of challenges for ourselves and claiming to be fantastic about sustainability. But actually, look back historically, we were far better. So we built a little pavilion for that, and we managed to keep the 1948 course going, which is very satisfying. Um, I'll just 
touch on a couple of other projects to sort of conclude. This was a much bigger project we did for uh, Brent Council, which is uh, one of the councils in the centre of London. Another very green project, um, and we used a number of measures on this project. This is a sort of cheaper build council. They all, all the facilities in one space, a so big public building. Uh, again, working very closely with the engineers in terms of ventilation, solar controls on the outside. So we had this big space in the middle that we managed to ventilate. And these big atrium spaces are very useful in these buildings because you can use them as a, a reservoir for air. But we had some really interesting CHP, combined heat and uh, power systems on this building that made it performance really uh, way better than any other public building in the UK. So there was a, there was a CHP system that could run from anything from wood chips to leftover cooking oil. So that was a very, very flexible system and powered the sort of engine behind how this whole building worked. And then after that, we used pretty much all the other devices we've used on the other buildings. So we were applying what we've done at Yale and these other projects on a much bigger scale. This has been a very successful building, very nice public spaces inside. And then uh, just finally, this is an experimental project we didn't build. This is a competition we did, which was fantastic fun. So I worked on this with expedition uh, structural engineers and Patrick Bellio Atelier 10 on the sustainability. This was for the British base at Antarctica. Uh, and they had had five previous bases, which had all kind of been disasters. It all failed because the snow and everything had come. And uh, so the challenge is the Brunt ice shelf is, can only take six tons of weight. And you need to put a really big, heavy building at the far end of it. So you have to be able to get all the equipment over this thin ice. And then when you get to where the ice, um, the Brunt ice shelf is, and they've been taking the measurements there since 1956. And they were the people who discovered the hole in the ozone. So they had to keep taking the measurements from the same place. But the, the uh, glacier is moving slightly, so they would have to keep moving. So we had this idea we could design a walking building. We loved all their bits of kit they have. It's like a fantastic kind of uh, science fiction adventure. And so we said, OK, look, if we make shipping containers, we can package all of this thing up. We can make it as a series of parts that are demountable and plug and play, and you put them all together very sophisticated, totally self-sufficient machine. Um, what happens when the building gets in place is the wind and the snow make snow pile up around it. So we did lots of work with RWDI in Canada about the shape of the building and making a profile so the snow didn't build up. All the previous ones have got buried in ice and snow. So this is the, the building we came up with. So it has a very efficient aerodynamic shape. It's made out of all these uh, shipping containers bolted together. It's totally autonomous. When you're down there for three months of the year, you can't escape. No one can get to you. No helicopter, no plane can get to you. So this has all everything you need to be totally autonomous. And it also walks. So we made this hydraulic system where its feet could walk. We put photovoltaics on it. The angle of the sun down there and the reflectivity of the ice and the snow mean you actually want the photovoltaics vertical, not horizontal. And then we actually put a running track around the outside. So if you start to go a bit crazy, you could go out for a run. And that was the building. We designed it with these legs that walked along on a hydraulic system. So it could, every week, just keep moving to stay in place. But we only came second in the competition, so it never got built. So we had to invent our own version of its reality. And then just um, very finally, I did the project. I was lucky enough to work on a project in La Spezia for a public hospital, 500-bed hospital, which started on site. <laughs> this is a sad story. Started on site a few years ago, and I think due to an argument between the contractor, the empresa, and the local authority, it's now stopped. But it would be nice to think uh, we could build a building in Italy one day. Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs>